Well, hello, Nativity Bible Heads. It is Dr. Wayne, and it is time for Sunday Morning Power Bible Study. Uh, it is for uh, Sunday, uh, October 16th. Uh, this is uh, proper 24C, um, the uh, 19th Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, got another reading from Jeremiah. In fact, this might be the last reading from Jeremiah uh, in our series. Uh, a, a quote from Psalm 119, uh, 2 Timothy 3, and then Luke 18. Let's get to it. Now, um, Jeremiah, uh, it, there's a section in the book of Jeremiah that's called the Book of Comfort. Yeah. Um, and you might understand why, right? Because uh, with all the um, gloom and doom that we associate with the book of Jeremiah and his writings, um, uh, any kind of encouragement, especially if it's succinct and you know included in a in a in a in a uh, specific area, it wasn't difficult for our editors to point to it and say, "Oh, look, it's the Book of Comfort." So um, um, today we are in chapter thirty-one. Now, a couple of weeks ago, um, was it? Yeah, a couple of weeks ago. We were in uh, chapter 32 uh, about the buying of the field, and, um, and it had some encouragement, right? So um, it's not like we're not used to hearing encouragement in Jeremiah, but this uh, passage today is one of the defining, and some people would even say redeeming qualities of the book of Jeremiah, especially with regard to the Christian church. Chapter 31, verses 27 to 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of humans and the seed of animals. This is, like I said, it's a word of promise. So, um, by the way, the word, uh, the, the word, the Lord sows is uh, what gets translated into Jezreel or Jezreel, okay? Do you kind of get the how it sounds a little bit, how Jezreel sounds a little bit like Israel? Yeah, Jezreel means the Lord sows. Israel, by the way, the word Israel means um, wrestles with God, okay? So um, our prophet slash uh, redactor, whoever put this together, we think are, it's a little bit of a play on words here, right? The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel. So I will sow Jezreel, the house of Israel. Get it? Okay. And the house of Judah with the seed of humans and the seed of animals. So after the exile, it's basically promising that, yeah, things are going to get back to normal. People are going to come back. And just as I have watched over them, to pluck up and break down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring evil, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. This is a direct uh, reference to the call experience of Jeremiah back in chapter 1, where he was told that his message is going to, uh, uh, sit back in chapter 1, verse 10, see, today I point you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and pull down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. So it always did include the cleaning out of something, pluck up, pull down, destroy, overthrow, and then to build and to plant. That was in Jeremiah's commissioning, okay? So it is in this chapter 31 where the Lord is now saying, okay, yeah, I did all that and uh, guess what? Now I'm going to fulfill on all of that. I, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. So all of the calamity that had come to Israel in the exile, the Lord is saying, yes, I did that. I'm also going to be faithful in doing what I promised, which is to build and to plant. So once the cleaning out is done, the rebuilding begins. In those days, they shall no longer say, the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. 
this is kind of a funny, kind of a uh, odd sounding uh, proverb, uh, if you will, to our ears. But what it's basically saying is this. The, the belief was that, uh, okay, so the parents have eaten sour grapes and the, 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 the children's teeth are set on edge. The, it's as, as to say that because of what happened to the parents, because of the experience of the parents, the children's experience, because of what the parents did, the children's experience is tainted, okay? That kind of a thing. Um, uh, we wouldn't use that kind of a thing, but it's almost as though, like, it's, it's almost said as a, um, it can be said as a, uh, an excuse. Like, well, what's the use of even trying? Our die is cast. Our ancestors really messed it up for us, so therefore, there's nothing new. There's nothing we can do about the the terrible fate that we, uh, you know, that, that's overcoming us. In those days, they shall no longer say, "Yeah, the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children." So it's like this time of resignation and the time of like, well, what can we do about it? It's it's all the die is is over. Yeah, okay. Verse 30, but all shall die for their own sins. The teeth of everyone who eats sour grapes shall be set on edge. So it's, the idea is that the time, uh, the, it's no longer, no longer can you point to the past and say, well, they really messed up our future. No, not anymore. That's what it means, all shall die for their own sins. It's not uh, trying to put out a new theological uh, dictum. We all know that um, we're all responsible for ourselves, but we as human beings tend to like to point to an outside influence and say, well, I couldn't help it. That was just the way it was gonna happen because of what my ancestors did or those choices from the past and all of that. All shall die for their own sins is another way of saying um, everybody's going to be held responsible. There's like, there's a new sense of accountability going on. The teeth of everyone who eats sour grapes shall be set on edge. So no longer do we have to point to and blame others, which we tend to do, and we still do. Verses 31 and following. This is the second of the days are coming. Uh, by, by the way, um, these um, paragraphs that we're reading are at the very tail end of what's called the Book of Comfort in the Book of Jeremiah. And there are three oracles, and all three of them start with the days are surely coming. We're only uh, getting the first two of those three. Um, but this second one here is one that the early church latched onto big time, okay? Get this. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Yeah, not only is Jeremiah's prophecy uh, being told on behalf of the southern kingdom, but also the northern kingdom, okay? It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, Though I was their husband, says the Lord. Um, uh, the word in Hebrew there also means like master. But the imagery that we get in the prophets is as though the, the relationship between the Lord and his people is that of a marriage, okay? Remember in Hosea, where Hosea was asked to take a wife of, of porneia, of harlotry, of, of, of yeah, questionable reputation and he was led to have the experience of like what it's like to be God with his people not knowing whether or not your wife is sleeping around and not knowing um, if your children are really uh, yours that kind of thing well the imagery of the broken covenant <clears throat> that uh, that Hosea started well that is what Jeremiah is building on here it will not be like the covenant that I made with ancestors when I look, took them by the hand to bring them out of the end. So, so it's like um, uh, uh, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband. That got broken. It was like, remember the offspring of Hosea, not my people. Um, 
the Lord so Jezreel, uh, Lo Ruamah, um, I can't believe I can actually remember two of those kids' names, um, and Lo Ami, <laughs> not my people. Um, this is uh, uh, a tradition of prophetic literature to see it as a, like a marital relationship that has been broken, okay? <clears throat> The covenant that they're talking about that was broken was the one at Sinai, right? Something that was written on tablets of stone. Verse 33, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them. Yeah, instead of putting it on tablets of stone, I'm going to put it inside them. It's not said how and I will write it on their hearts instead of stone, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is classic covenant literature. Um, in, uh, in, in the book of Hosea, it was said uh, that there was this, the, the breaking of the covenant. It's like, not my, I am not their God, and, um, and they are not my people. Jeremiah promises something different. Can, can you see how the early church would read this and say like, well, you know what? This never did totally get fulfilled, did it? It is fulfilled though in what Christ did. Verse 34, no longer shall they say to, uh, no longer shall they teach one another and say to each other, no, the Lord. Okay, this is a reference to the fact that um, the, uh, the, the Torah of old was something that you had to study, you had to meditate on it, you had to read it, you had, to, it's like there was a, there was a, it was like, it was, it was perceived as, it's a lot of work to actually get this to go on in your life. And the picture that's being painted here is of a future of like, okay, um, we're making it too hard. It doesn't have to be that difficult, okay? No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, no, the Lord, for they, shall all know me. Yeah, it's as though the, and I hope that you get how in Jeremiah's day, um, this showed a promise of fulfillment in that, the, in that they did take back the land, um, uh, but it never got reinstituted in a way that got written on their hearts. It became something else, okay? That's the reason why we in the church believe that when Christ came, that's when this got fulfilled to its concluding end, okay? For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Yeah, um, um, I don't really want to uh, belabor the point on that, but uh, I hope you can see how when the early church took their readings of the scriptures that they had grown up with as Jewish people and saw this and, the, and combined it with their experience of who Christ was and what Christ did, they started to put two and two together and see like, oh, this never did get totally fulfilled. Don't get me wrong. Jeremiah is not talking about Jesus. Okay, he is not talking about Jesus. He is talking about a promise of God to restore his people in a way that it's final, that it's conclusive. And we see what happened in Christ as, okay, now that, that fulfilled it. This is the witness of our church. This is the witness of our tradition. And this is the witness of our uh, experience. Psalm 119 points to, and now we're going to move on to that, in ch uh, chapter 119, verses uh, 97 to 104, Psalm 119 points to the resolve with which the people uh, uh, started to embrace uh, the Torah uh, after the exile in a way of like, oh, we don't want to let exile happen again. And so there was like a re-upping on the taking uh, boldly into consideration what everything, uh, what the teachings were. Psalm 119, by the way, is um, 
it's actually like 22 different psalms, okay? Um, it is an acrostic. It is one where uh, you have uh, 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 each paragraph begins with um, another letter of the Hebrew uh, alphabet. This is probably done for uh, memorization purposes. And um, uh, in uh, Psalm 119, um, you have like six or eight verses, something like that, of uh, that begins with each letter, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Nun, all the way through to Sin, Shin, Tov. So uh, what we have in verses 97 to 104 is the letter Mem, which is our M, but it doesn't really have any significance about that at all. It's just that this is a, an example of the way people saw the, the teachings and the law in the wake of restoration, in the wake of coming back from exile. Verse 97 to 104. Oh, how I love your law. Remember the word law is Torah. Tor and the word law is very unfortunate, but we're stuck with it uh, because of the way the, um, the, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the scriptures uh, translated as law, namos. Uh, but um, uh, it means teaching basically, okay? It is my meditation all day long. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is always with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your decrees are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn away from your ordinances, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Uh, interesting uh, turn of a phrase, uh, especially considering the fact there was a point in Jeremiah's ministry where um, the words he was given to eat, uh, it was done symbolically, uh, didn't taste well, didn't taste good in his mouth. Yeah, exactly. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. This is, it might sound like a boast, but it's kind of a, it's something that it's said from a commitment, okay? It's said from a commitment to like really hunker down in the teachings. This is the way that Israel applied the, uh, the promise that Jeremiah gave of a new covenant and a new opportunity and uh, a new chance at, at, at living for God, okay? Um, chapter 119 is the whole thing is a meditation on the love of the law, okay? And um, uh, this does degenerate during that intertestamental time to the point where when Jesus comes uh, and walks the earth, remember all of the, the, uh, the um, conflicts he had with the Pharisees and such? Well, this is why, is because they had doubled down and hunkered down so much into like, okay, we're not gonna let this happen again. We're actually gonna, we're actually gonna keep the law. We're actually gonna be faithful this time. This reflects, this Psalm reflects that kind of commitment that does deteriorate into what uh, Jesus found in his day with the Pharisees and such. All right, moving on to our New Testament readings. And you know what? This might, um, this dovetails nicely uh, if, you, uh, if you pay attention. Uh, we are, <laughs> uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 to uh, chapter 4, verse 5. As for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Remember, this is, uh, uh, I believe, a, a, an elderly Paul writing to his mentee, um, Timothy, uh, in his old age, passing on wisdom, reminding him of what works, what's best, what's, uh, what, what he should hold on to going forward. He points back to the past. Um, 
uh, get this. There is, uh, uh, um, you know, there's a, there's a movement amongst uh, a lot of us enlightened people, okay, of like, gotta go forward, you gotta embrace the future, you gotta, you gotta look for new experiences, embrace it with coming together. This isn't saying that's bad, this is just saying that when you are in a, uh, a battle for, uh, uh, for what's right, there are things that you, there are times when you need to look to what you've been told, okay? Because there are things that will, that will tickle one's fancy, tickle your ears, tickle your brain. This isn't a reference to I, I don't want to go into a, a whole lot of detail, but I've heard preachings about this that say a lot of bad things about even the kind of theology that I have. But listen to this, verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This is a reference to the Hebrew scriptures. It has to be a reference to the Hebrew scriptures. Why? because of the fact that there was no collective body of New Testament writings at that time, okay? Though that actually hadn't happened yet, okay? So it's referring to, Paul is pointing to the Hebrew Bible. That's one of the reasons why we still, that's the reason why I like to concentrate on it so much is because when we look at it uh, properly, we are led to faith in Christ. Inspired by God, useful for teaching, so that everyone who belongs to God, this is the last verse of chapter three, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. Um, uh, does this not dovetail nicely with the emphasis on uh, what the uh, psalmist was saying with regard to the, the, the instruction of God, the Torah, studying the law, oh, how I love it, how it makes me wiser than anybody else. And it, it, it points back to there's a certain solidarity in what we have been told. Get this, verse uh, one, chapter four. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you. So this is the, remember the promise is that, uh, the, the belief was that it's, he's not going to tarry too long, okay? It had been a little while. Um, they started to see people die. They still were very anxious for what's called the parousia, the, 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 the coming uh, of Christ. I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message. Be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. Paul's instruction to Timothy is, don't ever let the circumstances determine how you are being about what you were called to do in proclaiming the message, okay? For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, you know, like that, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires. Um, one of the things that the Paul is trying to overcome with Timothy is that since Christianity had moved so far away from its roots in, uh, in Israel, in Jerusalem, in the Jewish uh, you know, milieu. They were now in, this, in the Greek world, right? And there were certain teachings that were trying to put, uh, like blend Christ in with uh, the philosophies of the day that the Greek culture had uh, 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 made popular. And Paul is saying, be aware of this. Don't let that be so seductive to you. Christ is that thing that's preeminent. It is sufficient for what uh, God wants to do with the world. We don't have to blend it in with that, okay? Verse four, uh, so yeah, so for the time, I'm gonna go back to re read verse three. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, 
but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires. And verse four, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. Yes, there were those, uh, we were familiar with mythologies and such, and such like that. Um, very instructive, very uh, much teaches us a lot about the mindset of the people of, of that, uh, you know, of that, um, area, that area of the world. And what Christ did, we don't want to mold it up and just become one more, he's not just, you know, one more Atlas, you know, one more, you know, uh, Zeus. That's not what, who Jesus is. Paul was very clear. He wanted to make sure we kept this, keep it, keep it clean, keep it clean, because um, uh, you're gonna go down a slippery slope if you do that. The distinctiveness of Christ must be maintained is what he's saying. Verse five, as for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. Do you get the, the kind of uh, encouragement that Paul is giving Timothy? Um, uh, 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 it's as though he's saying, um, I've, uh, the past uh, is, what, what I taught you is that nut that from which you want to water that. You want to let that grow. You don't need to add something else to it. Let that grow. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't uh, find new ways of expressing the same truth. Uh, we do. But there's a truth that uh, is common to that seed, and that's what we want to always concentrate on. What's the fruit that's coming from that seed that got planted and is now uh, producing uh, growth? Okay, that's a wonderful teaching. Um, we're gonna go on, Luke 18, Luke 18, verses one through eight. Now, one of the things we wanna keep in mind here, um, that the context here, we didn't read, not, so last week we were uh, in chapter 17 and we finished with the verse 19. And then um, uh, from chapter 17, verse 20, and continuing into this chapter 18, the context is, when is the kingdom of God coming? Okay, um, and so this, there's this, this concern. Now remember, uh, a couple of generations have passed when we get uh, Luke. Um, uh, the church had seen loved ones die. People had passed on, and, and, there were, and they were, they're starting to lose a little hope, okay, in the parousia. The parousia is the, uh, the par parousia, that's the, the uh, Greek word for coming, okay? That's what they call the return. Um, um, uh, later writings were called the eschaton or whatever. Um, it's uh, not the same thing as the apocalypse. That's the uncovering of the end of the world and uh, all, all the, that's, a, that's another realm of existence. We're talking about the early church's belief in the fact that Jesus, after his resurrection, promised he would come, okay? That's what we call it, the coming, the parousia, okay? So in chapter 18, verses one through eight, that's what we have in our reading, he is addressing this kind of a losing hope, this kind of a where's your faith that this is still gonna happen, okay? That's the context, okay? Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. So this isn't a, uh, uh, so much a, a teaching on prayer as it is a, a message about not getting bogged down in the fact that, oh, he's been so long. When is he really going to come? Is he really going to, is he really going to come? Is he really gonna make good on his promise? Jesus is addressing that kind of a concern. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. So just FYI, uh, we want to make sure we get that in parables, we don't always, uh, we don't, uh, we don't 
necessarily have a one-to-one -one correspondence of, oh, this person represents God, or this person represents that, you know, that's, that's an allegory. That's not parable. Parable and allegory are not the same thing. This parable is, uh, and as I've said many times, parables are meant to tease the mind into active thought. Tease the mind into active thought. God is not the judge in this, okay? There was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. By the way, widows uh, in the early church, it was almost like a category of people in terms of uh, the uh, things that they had to keep on their radar as far as ministry was concerned. So in um, uh, Luke's addressing the church, that's not uncommon uh, for the, the, these illustrations of widow to be specifically with regard to, remember they didn't have social security back then. There were women who didn't, who, who, whose husbands died and they, and they left them with not what they needed. <laughs> and so the church was that vehicle of ministry for this particular category of people in that world, okay? So they were especially accountable for widows, is what I'm trying to say. Verse four, for a while he refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God <laughs> and no respect for anyone. Yeah, okay, yeah, how could this, yeah, so please, yeah, right? Don't equate this with God. Yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. <laughs> and the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. So it's like, where he's gonna go with this is saying like, yeah, and God is not an unjust judge. So if an unjust judge is going to relent and give the importunate widow, that's what it means when you keep asking for things, and give and the importunate widow and give her what it is that she's asking for, don't you think God's gonna do the same? Yeah. Um, and the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Remember the context of when is the kingdom coming? When is the kingdom coming? Persecution had started to take a, a toll. They had started to realize that, remember, they, they, they started to realize um, uh, disaffection with their, their Jewish friends. Um, they started to uh, 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 get, they were starting to lose heart in like, really, is it worth believing that Jesus is going to come? Is that really worth uh, the faith? Is it really worth the investment of my energy and my, and my love and my concern and all of that? Is it really worth it? Will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? Um, the delay of the parousia was a big concern of the early church. In fact, many of the writings we have in our New Testament are in expressly intended to counteract the, uh, the, the lackadaisical, the... the, the the giving up, the resignation. You know, people were starting to be resigned and cynical about, oh, is he really coming? Um, this is a teaching to counteract that kind of resignation and since This should actually be supremely applicable to us today in the 21st century, right? <laughs> After all, um, it's been, you know, 21 centuries uh, or 20 centuries, if you, however you want to look at it, uh, from when this writing was done. So if they were starting to lose heart then, whew, how, to what degree are we losing heart today, right? Will he do long lay in helping them? Verse eight, last verse. I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. Now, quickly is relative <laughs> quickly is relative. How do we experience quickly? Um, 
Uh, that's the really the key thing. Quickly can't be measured in uh, tick tock, tick tock, okay? Um, it is uh, something that's experienced through the life of transformation, I believe. I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. Yeah, like well, if the unjust judge does that, be like the importunate widow. Be like, keep coming, keep coming uh, for the Lord's sake. Keep coming, keep coming to the Lord. That, that when we do that, what we're doing is creating for ourselves a future that we find ourselves valuable in. We create a future that then becomes uh, uh, something of use to us. We find ourselves creating the future we, uh, we ourselves want to live in, okay? This is the nature of the life of faith. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? See, um, that la concluding comment will seem totally out of sorts if we don't take into consideration the context for the entire teaching, which is the delay of the parousia and the coming of the son. Will he find faith? When he finally does come, will there still be faith? Because he's gonna come whether you have that faith or not. So um, your looking forward to it will transform your experience of that waiting. And um, quick or not quick, but quick is uh, all in the experiencing and not in the TikTok. Okay, folks, that was it. That was fun. Um, until next time, peace.